All right, we're back. You pressed play, and I'm so grateful that you did that. I am so humbled to be your host, Mike Cunningham, National Business Development Manager for Gill Athletics. And today, well, this is a special week. This is a big week for track and field. It's relay week. We've got two of the biggest, best, brightest relay meets going on at the same time, which always boggles my mind. Uh, but they do it, and they do it very successfully. And today, we're going to go East Coast. We're going to talk about the Penn Relays. Help me welcome the head coach, director of track and field for the University of Pennsylvania, and also, I don't know how he fits both of these in, the director of Penn Relays. Help me welcome the wise, the wonderful Mr. Steve Dolan. Steve, how are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. It's really an honor and uh, followed your podcast over the last year or two, and uh, I've had a lot of great guests. I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, you know, the the goal is like Pokemon to catch them all. So I've got a lot of episodes to go before uh, I can finally wrap it up on this thing. So uh, super excited to have you here. You know, we do, we've had several Ivy league coaches here and it always um, boggles me how you coach in such an academic institution. So it's always great to learn more about what you guys are doing there at university of Pennsylvania and to learn about, uh, I don't know, is, is, is there an official nickname for the pen relays? I want to call it the granddaddy of them all, kind of like the <laughs> masters, but it's like, I mean, come on, if you don't know about the pen relays, I'm not sure you're in our sport, no matter where you are in this great country. Uh, so we're excited to learn about the pen relays as well in your role with what you do for that great meet too. Yeah, well, I, I guess the, the catch line on that was they call it the pen relays carnival and the, the carnival atmosphere is something really known for. So or certainly in the stadium, it's a carnival track yeah. and field is with all the different events. But then outside the stadium, we've got vendors and lots of fun things happening. And I think we're known as the Penn Relays Carnival, actually. And yeah, I'm really proud to be part of the Ivy League. You know, the, the history runs so deep with these eight schools. And, you know, it's really a, an honor to be a part of the conference. And uh, those that know track and field well on the collegiate level know it's a very competitive conference. So it's it's high level academic and there, there's a lot of history to these schools. But uh, our conference meet is, is something to see. It's uh, it's so competitive and uh, it, it's it's pretty neat. Well, before we jump into your story, uh, I got to say, I went to the pin relays for the first time in a long time last year. Uh, I actually went uh, when I was coaching, I was coaching at Mississippi State and we were pin relays guys. And so I uh, got to take teams up there two years in a row and experience it from the coach and, you know, uh, coaching athlete experience, but then hadn't gone back for a while. Uh, I was struck by how, I don't know if involved is the right word. Everybody was paying attention to everything that was going on, even during. So I, I remember, I think it was Thursday or Friday, uh, we were going through the four by fours uh, and, you know, we'll talk about scheduling and stuff, but, you know, we do a lot of four by fours at the pin relays. And I was just, I remember sitting back and kind of just observing like the crowd, every four by four people were into it. There was no like, oh, I'm here because, you know, my son's running, an hour from now. So I had to get good seats or whatever. Every single one, when someone would pass them, especially on the anchor leg, I mean, it, I was really impressed with how, like I said, I, I don't think the right word is involved. That's the word I keep coming back to how intense and involved everyone was to the meet and uh, the outside area with the, you know, the different shoe guys and stuff that were out there and different vendors. I was, it was a true event. It was a lot of fun as a fan. Like I got to go just kind of be a fan and just, you know, experience ton of fun. Yeah, I'm smiling. Sometimes I use the word extravaganza. I feel like it is mm -hmm. because you walk around the stadium and you've got all the vendors and the DJ and the video yeah. board and just all the action that's going on around the stadium. Then when you're in the stadium, you're right. The crowd is very unique. They're super engaged. They just love competition. They don't care right. if it's heat 27 of the right. small schools four by four or if it's a, a high jump or long jump that's happening. They don't know the people. When they see a great performance or a great competition, the crowd responds. And that's yeah. the thing that's so cool for the athletes that have run. Like if you come around that final curve on a relay and you're battling somebody, it doesn't matter if you're running a 60 second quarter or, you know, 45 second quarter, the crowd's going to respond. It's it's pretty amazing. It's a lot of fun. Engaged. That's the word I was looking for when I was saying involved. Yeah. Engaged in every single thing. And, and you know, it gave me a lot of hope. I was on the second tier on, uh, I think it was the last day, so Saturday, um, about what this sport could really be. Cause I'm always struck, you know, we're the most participated sport in the country on all levels. So high school boys and girls track and field is the number one sport for, for, for uh, participation on the college level, men and women track and field participants, the greater one, we have more programs than anybody else. And yet we struggle a lot of times with a, I'm gonna call it a regular meter, even a big, you know, USATF in, uh, uh, indoors, things like that struggle getting people in the stands. But uh, what struck me on Saturday 
there was a high school race and Shanti Jackson, uh, Vershawn's daughter was running. And uh, I think he did a 200. And, you know, I, I can't remember if she won or got second. It was, it was a pro or, you know, invite race. And, you know, she was a high school senior last year. And this group behind me, I think they were high school kids there from the Philadelphia area. They didn't know who she was. Uh, and, and I, you know, and I was kind of like, man, how do you not know who Shanti, you know, you're like, I'm like, you're a track kid, you're a track fan. It, it just kind of like gave me hope of like, oh, see, we don't have to have track nerds and geeks like you and I are, you know, we know every stat and everything. So of course we're going to be at track meets. We can have regular people come and be entertained by what we put out on the field. It just, it really gave me hope of like, we, we can do, we can fill the stands. We have a great product. We just got to figure some things out. So it just was really like I said, hopeful for me uh, in that moment there. Yeah. You know, one thing is you hit there that I've always thought about when people talk about how does track get better? How do we get more people involved? I feel like sometimes we always talk about how do we get people who don't know anything about track to come watch it? And, and that would be a neat thing to have happen. But I think you're right with the amount of people that participate at some point in their life in track and field. Like you said, the most, the high, highest participation of any sport in the, at the high school level. How do we at least at a minimum get that group engaged yep. beyond high school and following us? Because that alone would be a huge, yep. huge following. I, I certainly agree with that point. And the Penn Relays is kind of special. Like, I don't think every meet should be a mega meet like the Penn Relays. Yep. Uh, in, 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 and if you actually press me on it, I think a lot of smaller meets where there's good competition and are, are probably preferred. But the one thing that the Penn Relays does provide is that level of motivation, like you said, that we go from youth to high school to college to pro to masters. We run the whole spectrum. And I think that's something really special. When you see the youth watching, you know, the best in the world at the Penn Relays or, or the colleges they might dream about going to someday compete on the stage, stage on the same stage on the same couple of days, that's one of the magic parts of the Penn Relays. Yeah. Uh, to your point, you're more likely walking through your local grocery store to bump into someone who did some form of track and field in their life than played football or basketball or volleyball. They may not do track today. They may not have done it at the next level, uh, but they did it. So how how do we get that person back? They had some kind of love, passion for track and field, something, but, you know, small to big passions here. Uh, how do we get them to, to go to their local high school meet, their local college meet, et, et cetera? And, I, and I'm really thankful you brought that up about uh, the size of the meets, because I, I have been, I'm much more on the crusade of like, we need smaller meets. We got, I, I feel like we have to fit in a three hour window. However, I, I agree with you 100%. There is a place for the pin relays. The, the, uh, um, we have different types of football games, uh, basketball tournaments, things like that. I, I think there there is a place for that. I just think not every track meet can be a 12 day, 12 hour, 12 day sometimes uh, track meet uh, if we're going to have fans in the stands. But certainly tradition and lore and uh, the the presentation, uh, specifically like at a pin relays, uh, that absolutely fits in our sport uh, in some form or fashion. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're very much on the same page. You know, for me, when we run collegiate meets at Penn, invitational meets and so forth, we actually try very hard to do what you described. We try to control the amount of uh, teams, the amount of events and the time that we're going to be there. You know, A, logistically for the coaches and the athletes to not be there for 12 hours is preferable. And B, for anyone who's following it, you know, it's fun to go watch a couple hour exciting program. So yeah. I do think those are the best meets at large. And then here and there, maybe uh, some of these historic mega meets make sense. Yeah. But I think, you know, more meets that are, uh, intense and, and and good competition and, and shorter in their duration are, I think, also the the best way to do it. And Frank, we try to do that with most of the meets we host at Penn, other than yeah. the Penn Relays. Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Steve, uh, I was going to talk about you first and then Penn, and then we got into a Penn conversation, but we'll get back to Penn because uh, it's so big. We, we got to talk about it more. Let's get in our Wayback Machine here. Let's learn a little bit more about you. Somewhere in your life, coaching had to go from something that was done to you, assuming that you were an athlete. We'll talk about that. Uh, you know, Steve, go run this, go throw that to where it maybe flipped and it might not have been a, a light switch. It might've been a fader to, it was like, Oh, wait a minute. Like maybe I could be a coach. Like that, maybe that's an actual profession that I could do. Where does track and field coaching, where does it start for you? Yeah, and that's a great question. So a lot of people don't know this because I've been coaching on the East Coast and live in the Philadelphia area for quite some time. But I'm actually from the Midwest originally. Oh. So I grew up just south of Minneapolis um, from Minnesota. And uh, back in my day, we, we sort of, I was an all-sport person. So I just grew up playing everything. So I played baseball and football and basketball and track. And I'm from Minnesota, so everybody ice skates a little bit. You know, I, I did a little bit of everything growing up. And uh, actually in high school, I was a three-sport person. So in high school, I did football, basketball, and track and field. 
Um, so that's kind of my sort of competitive background. And then I definitely had a great high school coaches in all my sports and sort of love sports and had great support from my parents and family. But uh, at, when high school ended, I actually wasn't sure what I was going to do in college. I was uh, actually considering all three sports in some regards and actually went to a, a school in the Twin Cities called the University of St. Thomas. So oh, yeah, um, you're a Tommy. One program. Yeah, I was a Tommy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's where I went to my undergraduate degree. And truth be told, I went there, I was going to do football and track and field. I was going to be try to be a two sport person at the time they were in division three. But then someone got in my ear about maybe you're a decathlete, you know, you're an all sport guy. So maybe you should try the decathlon. So the kind of the summer before my freshman year in college, I started trying some of the new events. So in high school, I just ran sort of like 800 and down and a high jumped. And then I, I tried to learn everything else going into college. So the first time I actually focused on track and field was in college. Huh. And I took on the decathlon. So I had a lot of uh, fun with that. So in high school, I had a great coach, Brad Brewster. He's definitely a mentor for me. He was actually my freshman high school basketball coach and sort of talked to me into trying track. So uh, he definitely was an influencer on me as my basketball coach and then eventually my track coach in high school. And then I went to college at a great coach. Uh, Joe Thompson was the head coach at St. Thomas when I was there. He went on to be the athletic director at Luther College for a number of years. And he was definitely a big part of my uh helped me fall in love with track and field and was my decathlon coach. What kind of track, you're an all around athlete, you're doing all the other different sports. Um, but for track, do you remember what kind of track athlete you were? And what I mean by that, not necessarily how good you were or whatever, but like, were you the kind of guy, like you uh, wanted to know the workouts and why they were important? Did you read runner's world and track and field news or was it, you know, and you could definitely be excused for, you know, because you played all three sports at a good level uh, or was it just like, okay, I'm in track. So I'm going to run and jump whatever coach tells me. Cause I've got football practice starting in June to get ready for that season or whatnot. What, what kind of like level of intensity were you as a, as a track athlete? Yeah. It, it hooked me pretty quick. I think, you know, I, I always talk about that, you know, I started out as sort of, a multi-sport person that would, you know, was pretty fast at gym class. But then when I did try track my freshman year and mostly ran the 400 that year, you know, had some success with it and had some fun with it. And then it really grew through high school. So by the time I was a junior and senior in high school, I was really into it. Like, you know, a lot of us, uh, I would run sort of the long sprints was my probably best events. And I'd run the 800 and sort of like was state level qualified in the 800 and, and the 400, but wasn't state champion. Hmm. And it was a pretty competitive high jumper too. Uh, so those are the events I did in high school, but I did love it. And then definitely knew I wanted to do it in college. And then in college, I really got into it. Like mm -hmm. once I took on the decathlon, I mean, there wasn't a, a video or a meet or a book that I wasn't, you know, taking a look at to try to figure it all out. So in college, my coach was great, but he gave me the ability to sort of give my opinions and thoughts. And I really did become a pretty big student of it in college. I just sort of, you know, loved it. So, you know, the decathlon was a lot of fun and I was fortunate. I had great coaches and opportunities and I was fortunate to win division three in the decathlon. So that was a really cool experience um in my college years and then you know you talk about how do you get to coaching I, I definitely did not know I would coach like so I was a business major as an undergraduate certainly loved track and field but when I graduated college I thought hey I like sports a lot maybe I could get into the business side of sports mm -hmm. so my initial thought was could I get into professional sports on the business side or collegiate sports administratively or business side so I decided to think that maybe I could get my master's in athletic administration and kind of tie it to my uh my business background so that's where I kind of took that step. So I ended up my first coaching job. I moved east after college and I started coaching at the College of New Jersey. It was actually called Trent State College when I started and it became the College of New Jersey. And that's in central New Jersey, right outside of Princeton area. Um, so that's where I started my coaching career. And honestly, I was just there to get my master's. So, you know, the GA position that allowed me to get my master's was kind of the, the main goal. And then, you know, in my year of coaching that first year, I was like, wow, I actually really like coaching and maybe I could make a difference here. And I think what kind of motivated coaches, I thought about my coaches and stuff, and I feel like coaches have a chance to help influence people from 18 to 22, kind of not just the long jump and the sprinting and the distance running, but maybe you could be a positive person in growing from 18 to 22. And I saw my coaches do that. And I think that was my main motivation. I was like, hey, maybe that's my purpose. Maybe I can help people chase their dreams on and off the track and grow from 18 to 22. And I think that was my main inspiration. Uh, here I am 32 years later. So I... <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know I was going to coach and uh, ended up my career went 12 years at the College of New Jersey. I became the head coach at the College of New Jersey for a number of years. Uh, and that was a great experience. Loved it. And then I had the opportunity to coach at Princeton for eight years. I was the head cross country coach and men's middle distance distance coach at Princeton, working alongside Fred Samara and uh, mm -hmm. Peter Farrell. So that was a great experience. 
And then most recently, I'm in 12 years at Penn. So I'm the director of track and field the last 12 years at Penn. So I've been three great places, but definitely didn't know I was going to coach until I got on that path. So let's go back because it, it fascinates me that you became a decathlete. And most of us become decathletes, meaning we're not that in high school. There's very uh, few opportunities right now to do the, the uh, multi-events in high school. Uh, and we certainly have an affinity for decathletes. Uh, you know, my former boss, now retired, uh, was uh, uh, the 76 and 80 uh, on the decathlon team for Team USA. You know, so he had a huge propensity for decathletes uh you know well-known secret uh if you apply for a job at gill and you were a decathlete you automatically it's just a little bit more of like hey you probably gotta get the job you know you got a better shot at the job if you were a multi how did you it's interesting you were a 4a kind of kid uh, also did the high jump how did you that's one thing that, that's a rare combo right there that gets you at least two events right in the decathlon how did you adapt to these odd things throwing the shot pole vaulting. Uh, oh, you like the 800? Well, too bad. Now it's the 15 at the very end. How did you, like, I, I assume because you, you know, I, I don't I never want to assume, but you became the national champ that you kind of, you have to be a gym rat. So you kind of maybe love the challenge. Talk to us about how you accepted that challenge. Yeah, I think gym rat's a good term. I, I was a track rat maybe, but yes, <laughs> I, I love sports. I mean, I did grow up, my, my parents, uh, you know, definitely exposed us to a lot. So I think one of the things that helped me is, although, uh, I ran mostly like, you know, I literally ran from the 100 to the 800. So I run the 100, the 200, 400, 800. I ran all the running events in high school and then I high jumped, but that's all I was exposed to. But right. track was a short season for me. I just did it in the spring in Minnesota. Right. So obviously it was just spring track. It was a short season. And at my high school, we were really into basketball. We had a really good basketball team. So that was kind of the, the thing to do in the winter time. So my exposure was short, but I think I did have some aptitude for the decathlon. Like, you know, having played baseball and football and you know, uh, you know, water ski, snow ski, like I just kind of had that all around athletic background, which really helped me in the decathlon picking up the technical parts, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it came on pretty quick. And in the end, some of my best events were events I never tried in high school. So, you know, I was actually pretty good with the javelin and I ended up being reasonably competitive with the hurdles and some things I hadn't done in high school end up maybe being events I would have been better at in high school, just never exposed oh. to it. <laughs> but, uh, but it was fun. I did love it. You know, I, I couldn't get enough of it. If anything, I was the classical over trainer. You know, I would train uh. two or three times a day if you'd let me. So, uh, you know, I, if anything, I, if I look back at my career, I would have trained uh, more efficiently, not more, because yeah, I was yeah. more of the Rocky Balboa, more must be better uh, training model. Uh, yeah. That's funny. Uh, it, it's not lost on me, by the way, and we'll get into this. You know, Steve, I have you pegged as a distance coach. I did not see. Uh, yeah, not only was I the athlete, I was a national champion decathlete. Uh, we're we're going to talk about how that transition happened for sure. Um, but I'm struck by you said when you went into college, you went into business. So even and you talked about you had a great relationship with Coach Booster, uh, which you know you kind of strike me as a guy maybe had a good relationship with a lot of your coaches. Uh, was there no thought when you went to St. Thomas of like, oh, coaching, like it, it, it was just business. Like it was just like, oh, I do track, but academics is a different thing. Yeah. I mean, I was really serious about school and this sounds kind of funny, but I think growing up, I just didn't like understand what coaches did. Right. So right. I, you know, coach, my coaches came to practice and they worked with us, but like, I didn't really understand the, the complexity of coaching. And, I, you know, in the end, I guess if where my career has gone, I feel like I'm almost running a small business, right? So mm -hmm. I have unbelievable coaches and staff that I get to work with every day, which is kind of like a, my team, my, my co-workers here, you know, the department at large, our own coaching staff, and then, you know, making decisions and coordinating, you know, whether it's a schedule or equipment or recruiting. And, you know, I feel like my business background has really helped me a lot, you know, mm -hmm. in, in my coaching career, because I think you know, writing workouts is a lot of fun and, and working with athletes at practice, that's still by far my favorite thing to do. But the reality is that that's sort of a smaller percentage of my day. <laughs> the other 75% uh, of my day is probably not writing workouts and coaching athletes. So I think the business background has helped. And then, um, yeah, so I mean, that's that, that's kind of how I look at my business background, you know, how that influenced my coaching career. Did, were um, parents or family business owners or teacher? What, what was the, was there any like drawing from, from family? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I think a lot of times the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree. And uh, yeah, my father was in business. So mm -hmm. my father, uh, uh, when I was young, had worked with 3M, which is a big company in the Midwest, of course, oh, yeah. and actually became an entrepreneur. He started his own business. So he, he was, uh, he sold computer supplies in the IBM and 3M line. So uh, maybe his business acumen definitely, you know, helped me go that direction in my mindset. 
But then uh, I remember him specifically explaining to me, hey, find something you're passionate about and you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think he realized that I loved athletics and sports and working with people. And he definitely encouraged me to pursue coaching if it was a passion. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, I think the biggest light bulb for me when I realized that, you know, everyone wants to make a difference in the world. And for me, when I realized, like, hey, maybe my difference is I can help young people grow. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I've been able to do that the last 32 years. I hope that when most people look at me, they think, oh, you know, coach helped me, you know, get better as an athlete. But I hope they think I was a positive mentor and, and, and sort of helped them grow as a person because that's a big growth time. You know, you leave home for the first time and there's a lot of growing to be done 18 to 22. You know, I can see as you're telling that story, you're thinking about your own growth as an 18 to 22 year old and a 14, 18 year old. And, you know, that's one of the major reasons why, A, we started this podcast and B, what I do and why I do what I do on Twitter, on social media. You know, I, I think sometimes it's easy for us as track coaches to think, oh, I just help people throw a shot put farther. And that's cool. I, there, there's value in that. Or I help someone run the mile faster or jump the long jump uh, farther. And in reality, much like you said, you know, the amount of time you're on the track is actually pretty small compared to all the other things as a college coach. And as a high school coach, maybe you're a teacher. There's a, I mean, th that track practice is extremely small for what you do. And by the way, don't forget, we're also husbands and wives and sons and daughters. So there's, you know, we, we're family members, things like that. It's really the positive impact that you make on young people. V very few, and you, you've coached for a long time, Steve, very few, even for a guy who's had the success that you've had, very few of our kids go on and run professionally. And if you're a high school coach, honestly, very few go on to the collegiate level, but all of them go on to become business owners, teachers, moms, dads, clergy, doctors, et cetera. And that impact that you make on those young people, that is what helps society becomes better. And that to me is why I uphold the title of track coach so high. It's like, yeah, you know, and I love it when, you know, I go to nationals, I see you guys producing stuff that just is just bonkers, uh, you know, how fast and far and all these kind of things. But I look at those kids, I'm like, oh man, that that kid right there is going to own a business one day that's going to change the world. This kid's going to start a business one day that's going to change their family. <laughs> uh, that that truly is that positive impact you guys make on young people, immeasurable. It's one hundred percent immeasurable. I, I love that you you kind of were able to see that early uh, in your career and understand that it's not just how fast can I make my four by four team or <laughs> you know can I get another can I can I produce a decathlon national champion you know since you became one. So okay, you go to Trenton State. Uh, 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 TC and J is how I've always just said it out loud. New Jersey now. There you yeah. go. The, I couldn't think of what the T stood for. Oh my gosh. Uh, I had Trenton in my head. Uh, D3 school, correct? Yes. Was that, you know, you went to University of St. Thomas, which at the time was Division Three, just now recently, Division One. Was that a draw? The Division, you know, Division Three is a different than what Division Two and Division One is. Was that a draw of why you picked TC and J? Or was it more of like, hey, they had a GA position and Okay, so that's where I went. I think it was a little bit the latter. So I, it was a late decision that I was going to go for my master's. It was kind of like, end of my senior year, what am I going to do? And I was mm -hmm. like, you know what, maybe I could, someone sort of said, hey, you know, you've had some success in track and field. You love it. Maybe you could get your master's paid for if you could find a GA position. So that was kind of my inspiration. Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, I was, uh, I just looked for things around the country. So, you know, I, I had three sort of good opportunities. Interestingly enough, one was West Coast, one was South, and one was on the East Coast. And they were all very similar, sort of, you know, similar schools and opportunities. And I just felt like in my research that the the College of New Jersey opportunity, the combination of this athletic administration, masters and coming east would be a great opportunity. So I took it. And my starting point just with the decathlon background was I was the women's field events coach at the College of New Jersey. So okay. at the time, the head coach uh, was a distance person. He coached the men and women's distance and his wife coached the sprinters. So Ed Fitzgerald was was the head coach. He coached all the, all the distance runners, his wife coached all the sprinters, and I coached all the field events. And uh, that's how I started. And then it kind of quickly, just unique opportunity, I guess, lucky in some ways, but uh, I became the head women's coach my second year there, just based on, wow. on, on the opportunity. And then they ended up combining the program. So my third year of coaching, I'm the direct, basically the director. I'm the head men's and women's track and cross country coach. So it all happened super fast. And, uh, you know, we had a great athletic director, Kevin McHugh, um, the College of New Jersey is actually, you know, a really special school. It's a great school academically. Um, it is in the state system, so it's a, it's an affordable school for students that can, you know, have the academics. 
And they actually have competed in a lot of sports at the Division Three national level. Right. So I really feel like I was fortunate to land in a great place. I enjoyed the area. And we actually were competing. Uh, you know, we built it up quickly to the point of we were competing quite admirably at all six national championships. It was really a lot of fun. And I had a great experience uh, coaching and recruiting at the College of New Jersey. So let me make sure I get this timeline right. Your first year, and when you say your first year, you talking about your first year of grad work. You go in and you coach the field, field events. Mm -hmm. The second year, so still grad work, you're now the women's head coach. Yeah, it was kind of accelerated. So I did kind of a year and a half program. Oh, I okay. took an extra heavy course load. But yeah, I sort of a year and a half to get my master's. Oh, okay. But in the second year, I'm the head women's coach. And then the third year, the head men's coach had been there over 31 years, Rick McCorkle. He did a great job with the men's program. He was kind of at retirement stage. And he actually encouraged the athletic director to combine it, to go with the more combined model, to let someone really do it full time. Because he was full time teaching, part time coaching. That was the setup. So I was the first person ever to become, you know, full-time coaching at the College of New Jersey uh, based on that coach's recommendation. So yeah, by my third year, I'm doing both. So you're roughly 25 years old. <laughs> yeah, I was young. Seems so, like yesterday, but the years have gone by. But my favorite question, I ask this of every coach we have on the podcast, when they, if they've become a head coach somewhere in their career, their first time they become head coach, uh, you know, were you prepared? And, you know, we have, we have a lot of amazing, humble, uh, humility, high humility people and you know, the right answer is always like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I wasn't. Cause you know, you just don't know what the head coaching job, no matter how long you've coached, you had been coaching for, well, you'd only been coaching for one year before you became the women's head coach. And then only for two years before you became the director and not just the director, the first director. So there's no playbook on what, how we've run this program as a combined program. I, I'm not even sure how to ask the question. Uh, I'm going to ask it the, maybe the most blunt I have ever asked a question on this podcast. Forgive me. Uh, what, what the hell are you thinking? Like how in the world do you sit down and go, all right, what do I do first? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was exciting, but again, I, I showed up there to get my master's thinking I'm here for a year or two and then I'm going to go into the business world, right? Or professional or collegiate sports. So I caught the interest in coaching and I certainly, I think my decathlon background uh, served me well here. A, I had a little bit of interest and knowledge in all the event groups right. and B, like, I think the average decathlete, you know, likes to work. You know, I like, I like training. I like working hard. And I sort of said, Hey, I'm just going to like hustle with my recruiting, my alumni relations, my hosting meets. I'm just going to hustle. And and then I, I had great people. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was very fortunate to, you know, a lot of sort of part-time assistants that came and made it happen. But we had, you know, over 100 athletes in the program across both genders. And we were trying in all the event groups. And it was really a lot of fun. And But definitely a lot of trial by error. I mean, I definitely, you know, uh, a lot of stuff. I, I didn't exactly know what I was going to do. I was just going to put my best effort forward and see what would happen. And, you know, I was fortunate to have some great athletes that believed in, in what we were trying to do and some great coaches. And uh, we got it rolling. It was a lot of fun at the College of New Jersey. Now the 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 next two questions I always ask, and so this is going to be a little harder because you again you're quote unquote only in your third year of coaching. But I always like to ask the question: What was something when you became the director? What was something that you thought was going to be hard, but was actually easier than you thought? And you know when you become the director, when you're an assistant coach, sometimes assistant coaches don't realize just how lucky we have it. Sometimes uh, you're in charge of one event group, and maybe you're in charge of equipment or scheduling or something, but the head coach has, you know, what, what's the old saying? You know, the buck stops here. You have everything, scheduling, budgeting, um, home meet management, hiring, firing staff. Uh, maybe you're on committees to hire for other sport. You know, you're, you have much more responsibility inside the athletic department. Uh, again, this is only your third year, though. So was there something that as you did take that job that you thought, hmm, boy, it's, you know, it's going to be hard to do this part. Maybe it was recruiting. Again, all these hats you have to wear. But it ended up being like, oh, yeah, actually, I kind of fell to it like a, you know, duck in water. Hmm. I don't know if it was easy. I think the part I felt most comfortable with, you kind of asked me about my high school and college career. I had really become like, uh, I studied the sport really hard and I felt like a lot of my success in decathlon, I had some athletic ability, but a lot of it was, I just out trained people. I just worked really hard and tried to figure out to be the best technically I could. So hmm. I actually think the easiest part was I felt fairly ready even though i was young on the technical parts of track and field hmm. so you know i worked with lots of different event groups because i'm only full-time coach but like i felt most comfortable actually with the planning of the workouts and the training part like even though it was a lot of events to sort of be involved with the harder part was just getting comfortable with how do you recruit 
Mm. You know, how do you manage your budget? You know, those types of things were the things that took the biggest learning curve. Mm -hmm. But again, I had a great athletic director that was super supportive. I was fortunate to pick up some great assistant coaches. Um, you know, and the team was was great. You know, I think that I was trying to raise the bar, you know, like in terms of what good performances are. And the team just kept responding. Every time I put the bar a little higher, everybody jumped a little higher, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, you know, first we were trying to win our conference meet. Well, then that became kind of commonplace. Then we were trying to do well on the East Coast. And then we became that. And then also we we're trying to compete nationally. And it was really cool to watch the team. You know, it's the peer, the peer leadership was really cool to watch where they all got excited about what they were doing and, and just kept elevating the expectations. It was a lot of fun. And I, I think a lot of things I do at Penn today are not so different than my first years of we try to create a family atmosphere. Hmm. So because I was the only full-time coach, the men's and women's teams had to be together. And because I wanted all the events to be uh, important as a decathlete, we had a real mix of uh, diverse events that were together. And I think we really, to this day, that's my favorite part of it. I love it at Penn. Like last week, we had a jumper make a big PR jump, 7-2 in the high jump. And to watch our whole team rush them afterwards and jump around, men, women, all event groups, and be excited, that's the same stuff that used to happen years ago at TCNJ. And it's still the things I think is so, so cool about our sport. Like track and field, it's it's awesome. I mean – diversity of events, diversity of athletes, men's and women doing it together. So, I mean, I'm going on a tangent here, but I think some of the coolest things that happened at the College of New Jersey are still the things I get excited about here at Penn. Steve, my middle name is Tangent, so don't be afraid. We're, we're all good. <laughs> I'm going to get on my own tangent somewhere. And in fact, I'm going to keep on that tangent. I do love that because I think that's one of the hard parts about track is, you know, our throwers will be over here practicing, our jumpers over here, our distance guys and gals are on the road. And then we come to these meets, especially our conference meets, things that are scored. I, I'm a, I really do love scored meets. Uh, that's why I like the, the conference meets are my, uh, even over NCAA meets, I, I, the conference meets are my absolute favorite meets in the world to go uh, to watch. Um, so then we go to these meets and we talk about team and, you know, we, you know we're you know we trying to get first place, but we haven't been a team all year, <laughs> you know, uh, heck we even have, you know, still, and you know, whether you agree or disagree on this uh, teams that will send their throwers to this meet and then their sprinters go down to this meet. And then we try to culminate this with where the team. So to, to hear that story of like the high jumper uh, and then, you know, everybody comes to rush that that's a hard thing for track and hard thing for coaching staffs, so hard things for a head coach to instill that type of culture. And not everybody thinks it's important. And again, you know, I'm not here to debate that part, but uh, I think that's a, that's a hard thing to do. And so when it comes through, uh, bravo. I mean, that's, again, that's the culture word of what you're building. Yeah, I mean, it's really been fun. Like, you know, uh, again, a track is a collection of people competing in individual events. And, you know, when, when it's your moment, you, you stand there yourself in the long jump runway, you're standing in that circle, or you have to, you know, step on that starting line. So individually, you're in that moment. But boy, the power of the team, right? Like to train together, to encourage each other. And, you know, I saw it this weekend. We had one of the best weekends in a long time for Penn Track and Field, but it all happened in about a two hour span. I thought the success got contagious. You know, a couple mm. people hit a big triple jump. Wow, that was exciting. Next thing you know, the high jump was exciting and the pole vault, and then it was a fast run on the track. And I think that whole thing kind of grows. And yeah. it's something we have a lot of fun with at Penn. I, I just love the uh, again, we call it the family. We want it to be the Penn track and field family. They all feel a part of it. And actually, you hope it extends beyond what happens at practice in the meets, right? So, you know, are they looking out for each other up on campus? Are they making good decisions outside of practice? Um, you know, if a student has, is looking for class uh, um, selection, can their teammates help guide them to the best opportunities? You know, I, I like to think it, it is all those things. So, you know, we definitely celebrate the team atmosphere. And I think the individuals are better because of it. And, uh, it's a neat part of our of our sport, you know, and it's something we we try to we try to build. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think that's why we see uh, you know, a quarter miler who can can't break 50 in the open quarter, but then gets on a relay team and splits 48 all day. Uh, there's different when it's uh, you know, I'm beholden to that person in front of me that I gotta get the baton to, or I gotta help the person coming in with the baton. It's uh you're no longer running for Mike, you're running for pin. Uh, and I think that's why you almost never see it the opposite way. You never almost never see a kid who can only split 50 on the four by four, but then can run 48 in the open. It, it, I, I don't know that I've ever heard that, but you put a, a, a baton in hand and realize that you gotta go help Sally up there. And Tina's going to give you the baton. Special things happen when I'm running for someone else, not just myself in a PR. So uh, yeah, like boy, that. you see that all the time. We just had that experience during the indoor season. So our women's team had a, 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 a sort of exciting indoor season and broke the all-time Ivy League record in the four by four. And just oh. as you described it, every athlete, at least a full second faster than they could run open, at least, you know, uh, with that, with that baton in their hand, the power of a group, right? 
power the baton, it. baby. <laughs> I got to do it. <laughs> That's right. So uh, how long did you say you were at TCNJ? Not nine years? No, it's more. I was there 12 years from 12 beginning years. to end, you know, starting as a graduate assistant and but 12 years at TCNJ. When you, so kind of two questions. When you look at that time at TCNJ in, in totality, so just like you said, from a GA uh, to a veteran head coach now at that part, uh, how did you see yourself change? And kind of with that, kind of my second question is, when and where did that transition, I, I'm assuming it was at TCNJ, did we go from being a multis coach to a more distance focused coach? Yeah, so right from the beginning, you know, I did, I, you know, it might be a little bit surprising, but believe it or not, growing up, I did run road races and such, and I ran the 800 at the state meet level. So I had run some middle distance, and I actually was relatively competitive in road racing, although I didn't run racing cross country. Hmm. So I have a little bit of a distance flair to me anyways. Hmm. But then right away at TCNJ, I started coaching uh, distance. So when I showed up in the fall, um, I did kind of assist the head coach for that first year. And by the second year, I was the cross country coach. Hmm. So you know, uh, as the only full-time coach, I was coaching cross country and, and sort of loved it and, um, and then got some great people to work with me. But I, as my career evolved at TCNJ, I called myself the utility person. I would move as needed. So there were years I coached the sprinters. There were definitely, I usually coached the javelin, the pole vault, like I would move around, but I did coach distance on a real consistent basis through my years at TCNJ. So, um, you know, did have the background and did enjoy it. I, I love the process. Like, and one of the things that's cool about middle distance distance running is you can really take it to another level over time with hard work. And I really enjoy that process of middle distance distance running. Uh, but where I made the shift full time towards it was actually that next step in my career. So I'd had success with middle distance distance along with other events at TCNJ. But TCNJ is in a very close proximity to Princeton. And uh, I think the success we experienced there was noted. And when Mike Brady, who is the uh, head cross country coach and assistant coach at Princeton retired, uh, Fred Samara, actually, uh, I was really honored. He reached out and said, hey, would you be interested in this position? And uh, I was loving TCNJ, uh, wasn't necessarily actually looking or applying for jobs. But when he reached out and said, would you want to uh, take a shot at coaching in the Ivy League and, and work with me at Princeton, I, I had to take the opportunity. So Princeton was the first time I ever focused myself completely on middle distance distance coaching. And boy, it was a, it was a great run. We were fortunate um, to have a great run both at the conference level and, and, and somewhat at the national level. And I got to coach some special people in those years at Princeton. But I think by then that became my specialty, my identity. And then when I came to Penn as the director of track, I stayed in that in that event group uh, because I really felt comfortable and, and established my niche in, in coaching and recruiting in middle distance distance. But I still love all the events. So that's what's fun at the track meets. I feel yeah. at least somewhat uh, comfortable and qualified when I walk around and watch everybody compete, uh, which I, I still love. I love busting myths. And here's a myth of, you know, uh, the myth is the distance coaches only care about distance running and only care about the 10K on the track. And yeah, long jumpers, y'all do your thing. I, I love this distance coach here that is like going around to the long jump and the throws and the sprints and hurdles and uh, not only liking it, like, you know, want to watch and, and uh, see the kids compete, but knows <laughs> a lot about it and how to coach it and even how to how to do it. I like that. Um I've never made this connection before, and I've actually never really coached these two event groups. So, Steve, correct me if I'm kind of uh, wild in this idea. I, I guess I've never thought about the relationship of the multi-events and distance events um, and the, the the likeness of the results of it based on training. So in distance events, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, whether you're doing quarter repeats or mile repeats, you know, depending on the, what your final event is you know, you're always looking at how does that culminate in the, in the totality of what their 10 K is going to end up being, or their five K uh, there's a lot of math kind of involved into it from what I've seen, you know, with, um, uh, distance coaches that I've been around before the decathlon very similar. I mean, you know, nutsos on math on, you know, well, if I score this in the hundred uh, I need this in the long, I mean, there's a lot for the table. Um, I don't know if I've ever really thought about that relationship of the coaching side of those two event groups uh, and just how the process really drives the final result. Yeah. Well, I've really fallen in love with, I love coaching middle distance distance and I do really love that process I described to you. So again, you asked me very at the beginning, when did you become a student of the sport? And, you know, I love digging in and, you know, I'm certainly not a scientist, but I love trying to figure out and understand the physiology of it. You know, mm -hmm. like, you know, what does it mean, you know, the, the oxygen, you know, uh, getting the oxygen to the muscles it needs, how much lactate, you know, those types of things, and sort of understanding things like, like you said, paces or heart rate levels mm -hmm. or lactate, like, that's very interesting to me. So, you know, again, I'm 
32 years into this, but from a very long time ago, I started trying to figure it out, like what works, you know, how does the body respond to different stimuluses? And I really enjoyed the distance running. And I've been really fortunate, you know, all the way from 800 through the 10K to really have coached some very talented and dedicated athletes that have, you know, honestly been able to compete at at least the NCAA level and a, and a few beyond. I mean, you know, at Princeton, I was honored to coach Don Cabral, who finished eighth mm-hmm. at the Olympic Games after his senior year at Princeton. He won the NCAAs and just some really special people and uh, certainly quite a few sub four minute milers. I know that's become more commonplace, but when I started coaching sub four minute milers, it was uh, certainly quite hard to do. Um, but, you know, I just loved it. And I just love watching people get better. And, you know, some of my favorite coaching stories are the people, you know, that ran, you know, 420 in high school that break for, you know, four minutes in college. And right. I've had some of those experiences. And I just love that process. And you know, the decathlon part that I think has helped me too is, um, you know, coaching is multi tiered. So, you know, everyone can sort of, you know, everyone talks about how many miles do you run or mm-hmm. what type of interval workouts do you do? And those are certainly key pieces. But there's all the little things that are part of coaching, which is like, what are you doing for strength training? Are you doing any plyometrics? Is there speed development involved? You know, um, what are you doing from a flexibility coordination standpoint? Like all the variables of being a great athlete and and how do all those things fit into trying to stay healthy as a distance runner? So I think one of my strengths has been, I kind of call it the training puzzle. Like obviously I have to have a sense of how many miles and what types of workouts and that, but maybe one of my strengths because of my decathlon mindset is the puzzle. How do you put, where do hurdle walkovers fit in? How do you know, running drills, are they done properly? Like all those little pieces, I think have been one of the things that have really helped me, uh, you know, in working with athletes, trying to make them the best athletes and and being healthy. So I I definitely don't shy away from my decathlon experience being significantly helpful in my distance coaching. Where, you know, you have a business background, a sports administration, sports business, uh, master's type area. No, no, uh, you haven't talked about any propensity for exercise physiology and biology as as academia study, uh, certainly now as coaching. Where where does the role of coaching education play for you as you're moving through TCNJ and you know Princeton and now Penn? Were you a USATF guy? Um, you know, back when we first started, uh, we didn't have we didn't even have YouTube. We used to have those VHS videos that you know we'd get from uh, USATF, or we'd have flip books. We, you know, it's definitely grown in leaps and bounds in coaching education. How, how has that uh, coaching education played a role, if at all, for for you? Yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> I could list a million mentors, some that are people that I've talked to and met and others that are videotapes and books that I've read. Mm-hmm. But I think my coaching is definitely a, uh, uh, you know, come from a lot of different sources. And and what do I feel comfortable with? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I did everything you just described. I mean, I have, mm-hmm. I don't know how to view them anymore, but I have, you know, 30 or 40 videotapes someplace that I've watched right. a million times and can quote them like, uh, <laughs> like I can quote a, a funny movie. And uh, I've also read, you know, all the different books that were out there uh, of different people's training thoughts. And then also just been some great coaches. I mean, you know, some of the veteran coaches that have, you know, been great to me, you know, Tom Donnelly, who mm-hmm. coached at Haverford locally. I remember sitting down with him as a young coach and, and picking his brain and, you know, uh, Frank Agliana picked his mm-hmm. brain and, and, and many others that, you know, I've been kind as coaches to sit with me individually as a, as a young coach and, and sort of explain to me what they do. And I could name many others, but, you know, so yeah, I've, I studied a lot <laughs> just to try to figure it out. And I guess what it is, I, I a little from everybody, right? I, I wouldn't say that I'm strictly a Lydiard coach or I'm strictly a what Sebastian Coe did, or, you know, there's, you know, Jack Daniels or all these different legends. I've read them all and I try to figure out which of those make sense for what I'm doing, you know, and, and what the athletes I'm coaching. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, definitely uh, a lot of people have influenced what I'm doing with my coaching. You know, COVID has changed a lot of things in regards to peer to peer. So to me, there's coaching education's two things. I call it formal and informal. Formal is the USATF level ones and twos. And now, you know, USTFCA with their great uh, coaching education, Altus, et cetera. And then there's peer to peer. You're talking about, you know, you sitting down with gags or uh, Jack Daniels and having a conversation and talking about maybe specific examples. And COVID kind of changed things where we learned that, you know, Zoom and, you know, now I can, call up and, uh, you know, or watch webinars of almost anybody in all events. Pre-COVID, at least on my uh, perception, it felt like distance coaches were better at talking to each other and quote unquote sharing secrets. Uh, and, and other event groups maybe were not as much, you know, there was more of like, you know, I have a secret the way I coach throwers or jumpers or sprinters. So I'm going to keep that to myself. Uh, but now it certainly seems I mean, I don't know. It feels like everybody's talking to everybody and sharing quote unquote, every secrets. Um, 
is, is and you you know you're not really coming from the distance background now you know I'm thinking about it, it's like you know not like you came up as a distance guy a distance coach right off the bat you, you've had the you know the multi background um has the formal been more influential or the what I call the informal the peer to peer been more influential on your coaching education and your coaching style therefore yeah. I mean, it's a combination of the two. I mean, I did the USA Coaches Association sort of level one training mm-hmm. and some of those things. And, you know, I've, uh, I did a strength training session more recently with Boo, who's a, sort of known as an mm-hmm. expert in strength training. And so I've done the, and, and continue to do uh, going to clinics and listening to people and making notes. And, and I still enjoy that sort of formal uh, kind of training education stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I'm certainly, you know, uh, reading books isn't as popular as going on your phone anymore, internet, but I, I did read a lot of books over the years. Uh, and then, frankly, like you said, I, I wasn't shy about asking coaches that were doing impressive things to say, hey, do you mind if uh, if we sit down and have a cup of coffee or do you mind talking to me? And mm-hmm. you'd be surprised how many coaches are willing to open up uh, to you in that situation if you ask them. And I was honored that, you know, like I said, a few people that I I, 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 I think see in the highest esteem were like, hey, I'm glad to meet with you and talk about that. So it's it's pretty neat. And, you know, even, and it always evolves. Right. Like, you know, I think back when I started coaching. You know, at that point, everyone was like, hey, distance runners, we got to run a lot of event quality intervals. And I, there's still nothing's more important than event specific work. So intervals definitely have their place. But then I think it's evolved in this way. I'm going to realize that, hey, a lot of stuff in this sort of different zones of threshold level running is 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 really important uh, for your development and a little less injury potential. And that became very popular and has been popular more recently. Obviously, some things that Inga Britson has done with maybe some double sessions in a singular day has become real popular. So it's been fun to watch it evolve for me over the last three decades. And uh, I just try to figure out, Hey, what works for us and and what new things might I try? And, and, but it's a lot of, uh, a lot of people are influencing what I'm trying to do. And I think it's great, you know, so much more, you can find so much more now online than you ever could uh, when you and I started this, you know, our our professional careers. It's it's amazing. It's, there's really like almost no excuse now. I mean, we, we had excuses back when we first started. Now it's like, how do you not trip over coaching education <laughs> to open up a social media, internet, YouTube, et cetera? Um, would you consider yourself a reader? You talked about books a couple of times. Are you, are you a reader or? Uh, I, I, think, I feel like now maybe I'm, I feel like it sounds funny. I feel like I might've become too busy to be a reader. So I would sure. say not so much more recently, yeah. but I think in earlier in my coaching career, like that's a lot of the resources were, right? It was hard yeah. copy books and yeah. I would go get them all and read them. But I think more recently, I'm probably like everyone else. I'm I'm doing more of my research, maybe on my computer and online. Yeah. But uh, I guess I'm reading a lot. Maybe it's just not physical books. It's it's, yeah. it's not yeah. my computer. But yeah. but you know, life has gotten busy. But I you know I uh and I think the key thing too is there's a lot of things out there. You have to decide. I think as a coach, you know, I know we're sort of talking more about training, but like what really works for you and your athletes, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, I it's great to see what a world record holder just did. But you know, I'm coaching a high school sophomore. Like, does that high school sophomore is that the right workout? And I think the key for coaches is to figure out which bits and pieces of all the information work for your athletes mm-hmm. uh, at their point at your program and at, at that time in their development. And I'm trying to do that at Penn, like you know, Penn's different, right? I've got pretty young athletes relative to college scene and, you know, this is what we're doing at Penn, you know, so it, mm-hmm. it might be different, you know, than other college programs or what the pros are doing. All right. Uh, okay. I love to ask this question. You went from TCNJ to Princeton. Um, you weren't an Ivy League guy yourself, although St. Thomas is pretty good academically. I know it'll surprise you, Steve. I also was not an Ivy League guy growing up. So we have these perceptions of the Ivy League because we're on the outside. Uh, and usually those perceptions are pretty all positive, like, holy crap, it's you know Geniusville, USA, and all this kind of stuff. Any intimidation from you? You go to to Princeton. I mean, one of the top institutions around, man. I mean, come on, you you. If you get into Princeton, bravo. You graduate from Princeton. Oh my God, like how? I mean, it's just a quite a, quite amazing. Uh, you're with Fred Samara, one of the greatest people in the whole world, by the way. Uh, recently retired, love him to death. Any intimidation for you in regards to? Holy crap, I got to go coach these guys who are all you know. 35 ACTs and our future, you know, nuclear physicist and all this kind of stuff. Any intimidation at all uh, from your side as a, as a coach to the athlete? I think when I started, you know, I mean, Princeton and Penn, you know, very similar in terms of their, you know, the students are high achievers academically and they're certainly smart. And, and, and we are fortunate at places like Penn and Princeton to be able to recruit, you know, very talented high school athletes that are very driven. So I think the type of personality that I was seeing at Princeton and I certainly see now at Penn is that highly motivated, you know, 
uh, want to be an achiever type person. But I think the key thing when I started coaching Ivy League was I just wanted to make sure I did as the best job I could to understand and help people sort of chase their potential. Mm. I've always used this slogan in coaching, have fun chasing your potential. Mm. So A, at Princeton, I did the same thing I did at TCNJ and I do the same thing at Penn is try to set up an atmosphere that like everyone's trying to chase their potential, whatever that may be. And I also try to sell the concept that it's fun to chase your potential. It's fun to go for it. Like I've it. been using those statements for 30 plus years now. So that part of coaching, like chasing your potential, having fun going for it, that didn't change. I think I just worked really hard, you know, to sort of, I felt like you always feel like you have to prove yourself, right? So we had a lot of success and a lot of fun at TCNJ, but I felt like I did have to prove myself in division one and coaching distance that like I could help people get to that potential. Uh, but I was fortunate, you know, there was a lot of buy-in right away from the athletes. And, you know, I, I think the difference was if I coached someone that ran 425 or 430 down to 410, now I'm coaching someone that ran 410 and we're trying to break four minutes. Like the, the equation was the same, but I did work hard to make sure I got to know the athletes and, um, and, and that sort of, there was a good rapport in terms of believing in the training. So, I mean, there was a little bit, but, you know, I, you know, great student athletes. And I had great student athletes at TCNJ too. They were, they wanted to be the best, you know, the best athletes they could be. And I coached some great ones there. So it honestly didn't feel that different. I mean, I, yes, to, I would be lying if I didn't say it. at first I was, uh, anxious and want to make sure I did a good job and, and sort of like uh, working really hard to prove that I could uh, and do the best by the athletes. But it really wasn't a lot different hmm. at Princeton as TCNJ and it has, certainly hasn't been any different at Penn in terms of what I'm trying to do. And so it's it's been pretty, you know, pretty smooth in that part. Yeah. You know, made, you made a great point there about in, in there's certainly driven kids in every school, but maybe the percentage of I mean, super driven kids maybe goes up as in, into an Ivy League school. Do you did you and and still today find yourself with that with with a greater percentage of you know super driven kids and and not just athletically we're talking about here in all their aspects academically etc. Do you find yourself you more have to pull the bridle back like uh, I I think in distance running you know you you pro obviously prescribe you know what we're doing on the track and the total mileages in your long run. Do you find yourself you have to uh, make sure they're not, you know, we said 60 miles this week, uh, can't be doing 70. Uh, we said long run was going to be, I'm making up numbers here, uh, 10 miles, don't be going out and doing 12. Like, do you feel like you have to almost like pull them back to save themselves and make sure they're right, they're doing the right training? Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's a little bit true of all aspects of their life, right? So a lot of the people that have come into Penn and, and Ivy League schools, you know, they're, they're sort of like used to being sort of high achievers academically and athletically. And I think they're willing to put in as much work as it takes, or they perceive it takes to do that. So whether it's getting into a good life cycle where, you know, you're, you're studying and sleeping and eating and training at the right proportions, that's definitely an adjustment when you come into a place like Penn uh, that we, we work with. And that's certainly, you know, if you then take it just to the training piece, yeah, there's that. Uh, it's almost funny. It's like I said, my mentality was more must be better. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like I learned from myself that, you know, more is not always better right? because uh, you can run out of gas. Right. So uh, or get injured. So, yeah, I definitely think that, you know, uh, helping students grow in that of like, how do you uh, plan your day and how much is the right amount for you to be healthy and successful? Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a role that my coaches, the coaches on our staff and myself play in trying to mentor Um but yeah, they're, they're, they're highly motivated. And, but, but again, that's, it's also why people uh, do special things, right. Cause they're willing to, to work as hard as it takes to, to get the job done. So yeah, you know, the athletic, the athletic and academic preparation doesn't really, it's not really copacetic, right. On, on academics, if I read more, study more, I should do better on my test and have more knowledge. But as a distance runner, if coach tells me, you know, 60 miles, well, I'll do 70 then. That's that's not necessarily a recipe for success. That's it could be a recipe for injury, which leads us, you know, uh to the to the lack of success there. It's it's really about listening to the coach and uh knowing that you guys are on the right path of building up to whatever eventual mileage you get to. Uh, but so I can see those two being, you know, yin and yang on, on in a super motivated uh, individual who has their own pressures as well, by the way. I have to assume you're you're in Princeton and Penn. Uh, you're sitting around a room full of other geniuses. It's like, oh, crap, I better, like, what got me here ain't going to keep me here, so I better continue. And so same thing on the track. Uh, I ran 410 and I'm here. Well, guess what? Everybody and their brother runs four, four flat now. Well, I better step that game up too. So it's kind of a, it's a great pull, but you got to be careful of not overextending past that pull until the right time. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. 
So why go from Princeton, uh, you know, an amazing school and campus for uh, a lot of different aspects and go to Penn, another, you know, it's hard to, you know, compare Ivy League schools because they're all such just at a high super level. Why go from Princeton to Penn? Yeah, well, Penn was a special opportunity. So first of all, I acknowledge from a family standpoint in a second. So I've been very fortunate. My wife, Nicole, um, you know, she's been great. And as you know, coaches put a lot of hours and, and passion. It's not really a nine to five job. <laughs> it's a lifestyle job. So I want to acknowledge my wife, Nicole, has been amazing uh, in supporting my career and, and sort of been around for it. It helped me. Um, she was actually a track and field athlete. She ran at Wagner College, was a half oh, miler. Yeah. So she has a running background. Um, so understands kind of what I'm trying to do. So I, I acknowledge that. And one of the big draws actually for the opportunity at Penn is I'm really fortunate to have coached at three outstanding universities and really been in the same general area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's not always possible, but I was a little bit lucky that I didn't really have to move. And then I have two, two sons. Uh, my one son, uh, Tim, actually uh, is actually just graduated from Penn two years ago and, and got his master's at Providence College and actually working in New York now. But Tim ran middle distance for us at Penn. Wow. So that was a cool experience. And my younger son, Sean, is in his last year as a graduate student at Villanova and, and running, uh, you know, well in middle distance running. So, like, it's been a bit of a family affair. And the reason I bring that up is Penn was the perfect place for me because I've been coming to the Penn Relays for years and thought, wow, Franklin Field, the Penn Relays, I enjoy Philadelphia. I just, the vibe and energy around this place was always attractive to me. And then when I had the opportunity, you know, to sort of say, hey, you can be the director of track and field at Penn. And sort of, I think Penn's just an incredible um, opportunity, uh, A, to coach these great student athletes at a place that track has a rich history uh, was really attractive to me. And then also what we're trying to do at, at Penn, and, and I think hopefully people have seen that, but you know, Franklin Field's historic with Penn Relays, but we're also uh, honored to be hosting other meets in the summertime at Franklin Field and things right. like that. And what we haven't talked about yet is next fall, we're opening the uh, Dave and Jane Ott, right. uh, Center for Track and Field, right. a 200 meter banked into a track and field mm -hmm. facility we open next fall, which we're going to be able to host some great things for the sport there. So I just feel like Penn to me was this ultimate place for track and field on the East Coast, where sky is absolutely the limit in terms of what the athletes can do what we can do for the sport. I just thought, wow, I can't believe I get an opportunity to go to you know, and coach at Penn and uh, to be the director of track, right? To be able to be a part of uh, this kind of more global uh, goal of, of what we think we can do at Penn. So it was exciting. And for me, obviously, frankly, uh, the, the distance between the two schools is about 45 minutes. So uh, it wasn't a major life uh life move to to, to 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 switch and start coaching at Penn. But I'm lucky to coach in the Ivy League. I was very fortunate to get the opportunity at Penn and and, uh, you know, 12 years in and, and it's great. And I think the next decade will be even more exciting than the last decade. What did you, when you came into Penn, you know, now you have, <laughs> it's so funny compared that head coaching director job to your very first one, your third year, second, third year in what, you know, you're, you're, we're an amalgamation of our experiences, uh, with, um, big heapings of what our mentors and people along the way have poured into us. And, I usually focus a lot on the mentors of like coaches that have helped us, uh, you know, the people that you talk to during your peer to peer type coaching education, but also we have uh, as coaches uh, mentors of administrators and, and uh, outside people with, you know, maybe it's through church and things like that. So you're, you're this, just really, you're just this amalgamation of a lot of different people and experiences pouring into you. What, how did you attack being the head coach at Penn differently than, you know, and it's really a softball question, Steve, because your first head coaching job was as a two-year-old coaching. How did you attack it differently using all those experiences, mentors, people that poured into you through TCNJ, Princeton, now heading to Philadelphia? Right. Well, I think the first thing was, you know, be honest with you. So I sort of felt like I'd sort of done the job that I was going to have to do at Penn initially at TCNJ. Like, because like, I love the atmosphere we had there. We did have full teams, men and women, and we were competing at the national level and it was a hundred plus athletes. And we did have a great staff. They might've been part-time coaches, but they were great. So I felt like a lot of the team pieces, I felt like that was the template. Like I felt like I'd done it before and maybe a little bit different, at least in my time at Princeton, the men's and women's programs were kind of separate programs. It wasn't a combined model. So at Penn, I was actually able to go back to something that I had felt was successful uh, in my years at TCNJ. So that was the coaching part. And then I was also really fortunate uh, when I came to Penn. We had uh, some great administrative support. Penn made a big commitment to Penn's to track and field. Like We have a rich history, but I was the first time they've ever combined their program and made a director position. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know the alumni were passionate about trying to 
set Penn up for success. So our alumni have been very supportive and our administrator have been very supportive. So okay. we've added some coaching positions. We've upgraded our facilities. Um, just It just keeps, I feel like the ball's rolling down a hill and getting bigger mm -hmm. from the support that has been given. Uh, and I've been lucky to receive at Penn uh, to do what we're doing. So, uh, but Alana Shanahan, I want to acknowledge, she's our current athletic director. Uh, when I was first hired, she was actually the person that did the search. At that time, she was the associate uh, athletic director, kind of like number two in command. Uh, Steve Bilski was the athletic director. But Alana was the one that kind of uh, led the interviewing process when I came to Penn and was the administrator I worked with my first few years. But her support in those years of helping us with the recruiting process and the admissions process and, and our facility needs, like she just, she made a commitment. And, and the alums jumped on board and made a big commitment. And uh, now she's our athletic director running the program. So I think her and our alums have made this uh, our success. And I think what will be our future success possible. So, I mean, it's a little bit, the only thing that's different at Penn is there's a bigger, um, uh, broader responsibility with maybe alumni relations and sort of hosting events and things like that. But the, the meat and potatoes of the team part is not that different than it was at TCNJ. Uh, thanks for bringing that up about administration because it, it is a night and day atmosphere when you have an administration that supports you and specifically your sport uh for track and field versus uh that you're just part of the athletic department uh it, it is night and day when you see I, in fact it, as much as i believe in the power of coaches and, and what you guys do as far as success of your team i'm willing to bet if i go look at the top 20 of every ncaa championship uh those are probably the better administrative supported programs um, and it's more of an outlier that a, a, an AD or administration tolerates the track team and they succeed. You, you've got to have buy-in and support from that administration. It it makes everything easier, everything easier. Yeah, I mean, I've been very fortunate. I think about my career when I started, you know, uh, TCNJ, I was the director of ops, right? Of course, I booked all the trips <laughs> and buses and stuff. Well, I'm fortunate now. And again, I'm lucky because not everybody has this, right. but I have a great director of operations and they have an intern that helps them, right? And same thing, like I used to share an athletic trainer, but I'm very fortunate, Penn. We have a dedicated track and field athletic trainer and they have an assistant. So I know that I'm really fortunate because I'm, I'm in a situation here that's now in that small percentage that have the most resources and support. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage all the coaches out there, you know, to be creative and how can you find a way to, to do things? Is there, you know, student managers you can add to your lineup? Is there interns you could get to help? Like, how do you uh, do it? And I think that's what we try to do when I was at TCNJ. We didn't have uh, maybe the funding to have as many staff members and stuff, but we we were trying to be creative in how do we build out our team to cover everything uh, without the same resources. Um, but you're right. I think having administrative support and in our case at Penn, alumni support and those things are, are, are very, we're very fortunate. Let's turn our attention to this duality of the director of track and field at Pin so coaching events and uh, having a staff that coaches throws and jumps and all the track meets you go to and conference and nationals things like that and then you, uh, you you know a lot of institutions host meets and certainly a lot of institutions every so year you know where it's five or ten years host a big meet like their conference meet or something like that and some you know we keep getting smaller and smaller number of programs will host an ncaa championship you know again lots of people come into your area uh lots more to do than just you know schedule what time is the 100 meter dash you also have the pen relays the largest i assume uh number of participants and coaches and everything going on uh track meet every year when you first got there uh legendary dave johnson was the director of pen relays what was your role during that time as it relates to the pen relays did you just show up and coach or did you have any kind of administration actually helping with the meet what, what was the role when dave johnson was overseeing pen relays yeah, I mean, no, you mentioned he's a legend, right? So Dave Johnson was the director of Pageant Relays for a long time. He succeeded Tim Baker. Like, there's just mm -hmm. an amazing um, list of directors of the Penn Relays. So, I mean, it was definitely, uh, Dave was running that event and, and did a great job and, and 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 something that we've been doing for, you know, for, for over well over 100 years. So amazing. So I'd say my role in those first years is, if anything, I was just trying to be helpful if Dave needed any consulting from the coach's perspective. Okay. So, I mean, you know, he would make all pen relays decisions. Um, sometimes he would uh, inquire and I could sort of add perspective or help. Uh, but uh, but no, I, I didn't have direct uh, responsibilities per se. Uh, and our staff would has always helped with the pen relays, whether it was 
you know, once we get to the meet, whether it's executing distance night or I did help put together the elite mile field, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so we would all play roles in helping with the pen relays. But the build up to the pen relays was was the pen relays, Dave Johnson in his office. And, you know, and, and then honestly, you know, upon Dave's retirement, when I was named the director of the pen relays, our, our staffing alignment has changed. I, I, I might mention I'm very fortunate. I think we've taken a bit more of a team approach to it. So in the end, you know, in terms of um, big picture items is our schedule and recruiting of college teams and professional events and some of those things, I, I am in quite involved with that aspect of the meet. But when you dive down to the officials that really are the, the lifeblood and make the meet happen, you know, all the entries and procedures that happen for high school and college and all those types of things, you know, Aaron, Aaron Robinson is the associate director of the Penn Relays. Um, we were fortunate to get him to come from the New York Armory to take on that job. He does a lot of the operational aspects and then Claire Hewitt, who's both the director of track and field, uh, a, a director of track and field and the director of ops for the pen relays. Um, you know, she's amazing. So things relative to, to, to meals and hotels and logistics, like she does that. And we just have a team really. And then I, I would be remiss not to mention now I have a great uh, person. Scott Ward is the uh, associate athletic director that I work with now for pen track and field. He's also the executive director of the pen relays. Uh -huh. So all things budget, finance, and the, and sort of globally overseeing Penn Relays, Scott Ward does those. So yes, I'm the director of the Penn Relays. Yes, I have responsibilities. I'm proud to be a part of it. But I think what Dave Johnson did, what I did are different. We take mm -hmm. we have a bit more of a team approach, which is, is really working well. And I'm fortunate to have those people to work with. Uh, I met Claire at last December's USST, yeah, USTF CCCA convention. She's awesome. You are lucky to have her. I know you know this, but lucky to have her on your staff. She was great. Uh, and then Aaron Robeson, we had on the podcast and really uh, was struck by, you know, I've hosted meets, you know, I've coached in the SEC, you know, we, we had some pretty big meets there and things like that. You, you know, the logistics of schedule changes and things like that for a regular, a, a meet as big as the SEC championships is really tough. It really struck me when Aaron and I were having a conversation, he, he mentioned something like, um, you know, we wanted to move the girls four by four and the boys four by four because the girls had never run on, on Friday or Saturday. I could be getting them mixed up. And it was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You just, I mean, I know you do a lot of heats, but yeah, you just switch them. And it was like, Oh no, 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 no. The, and you know, Aaron, you, you know, you know him so well, he's so smart. Uh, you know, he's like, no, the average four by four for the girls team is X and the average for the boys is, you know, less than X. So you had to change just the, the puzzle. I could see the, like the, the, the beautiful mind puzzle pieces that have to move to move one event. So uh, really it gave me a lot of respect when we're coaches or athletes, or even just fans in the stands, we sometimes just think it, it just all happens. And oh my gosh, the amount of things that have to happen for it to just happen is mind boggling. What I'm curious about with you, you know, and you experienced this uh, at other, uh, you know, your other two stops and even early when you got to Penn, you know, being the director of track and field is a big job, Steve. Um, you know, we, we use the, the uh, hats analogy, you know, you wear a lot of hats, um, you know, obviously coaching itself. And, you, you know, we mentioned, you know, <laughs> that, uh, it seems like that shrinks more and more, right. With the amount of uh, paperwork and all the things that change with NILs and all that stuff. Um, you know, a recruiter, that's, a, that's a hat you wear. Um, uh, I don't necessarily want to say surrogate dad because you have kids that come from far, but you know, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're a support system for your kids that are coming from far and near being away from their family and uh, that support system that they've had, um, you know, some places, uh, academic advisor, I don't, you know, I have to assume maybe Penn has a, a unbelievably built out academic advising program, but um, uh, businessman, you have to, you have a budget that you have to set. There's all these things you have to do as the director of track and field. It's, it's really an impossible job to be real <laughs> blunt. It really, it really is. And then you get this other impossible job to help oversee the Penn relays. I mean, do, do, do you sleep? Uh, <laughs> do you just not coach anymore? I mean, something has to give. How are you able to meld two really full-time, over full-time jobs and do them well? I think the thing, I look at my career, and I started with this, and I think I've, you know, if you sort of say, what skills have you tried to work and grow throughout your career? And for me, it's been like, finding great people. Mm -hmm. If you can find great people and put them in places where they can be successful and honestly empower them. I mean, I'm, I'm trying all the time to find people 
that are as good or better, in most cases better than I am at, at tasks and empower them to do it, you know? And I, I think that's the, the reality. And I think all of us want things to be done right in the best way. And I know there's times in my career, I feel like I try to hold on to things because I feel like I know how I want it to go. But I think I've tried really hard. And the longer I get in my career, the more I try to figure out how do we identify people that can be successful or more creative or have the skill set and, and set them up for success and let them do it. So I think I think that maybe is the key. And I think I think more about that, you know, like how do I empower all these people and sort of set them up for success so we can succeed as a team? And the pen realizes it's incredible. We have these meetings, you know, we get organized and we've got someone talking about corporate sponsors, someone talking about TV, someone talking about, you know, uh, you know, high school uh you know, entries like that. It's just, there's so many facets to it that, you know, even at Penn, not just the Penn Relays direct staff, but Penn at large is an amazing uh, department and that has embraced hosting the Penn Relays that I always say everyone has to pull an oar. I mean, we yeah. have so many people, you know, the IT guy that makes sure that, you know, everyone gets internet to where they need it on the field. Right. And I mean, it's just, it's unlimited <laughs> uh, areas of responsibility. But again, we have a lot of great people that know what they have to do and, and make it all happen you know, for the pen realize. And like I said, I'm proud to be a part of that and a part of the team. And, you know, we did try to do some things. So, you know, we, we unfortunately didn't compete over COVID. So we, we took a year off or two actually, but we did uh, everything we could over that time to think about how do we improve and then grow. So the one thing I spent a lot of my time on there was talking to coaches and people and how, what's the next evolution of the pen realize. And we have done some neat things the last few years, Mike, like, you know, we wanted the college women to have the opportunity to compete on Friday and Saturday, just like the college men. Right. So that was our first adjustment. Secondarily, this started as a collegiate meet. We want to make sure that those top tier college athletes are still highlighted in prime time on Friday and Saturday. We made sure we made that happen. People said it's hard to warm up at the Penn Relays because you're in the city. We found ways to make warm up better on the infield and stuff like that. Like we needed better seating for the for, for athletes and access. We try to make like we just tried really hard and talking to coaches and people and, and Aaron and, and Claire and Scott Ward and, you know, Gail Zachary, who's been with us a long time. Like we try to figure out how do we make this better? We're going to do that every year. We're just going to try to figure out how we can make it better. And that's the part I spent a lot of my time on. Uh, and like you said, the second evolution was how do we make sure that high school girls have the same access as high school boys? And, and we found a way to make that happen. And, you know, we're just trying to keep, you know, and then we had to, you know, we added some nice pro events. We've been we've had some Olympic medalists the last couple of years come compete at Franklin Field, which it's fun to see them compete. So we're we're going to keep trying to push the bar. And and I spent a lot of my time on that big picture. How do we how do we evolve this to make it better? And then I have great people, uh, a part of our staff that are actually making it happen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how do you you know? I explained before we hit record. You know, there the two main goals of our podcast here. One is to uplift and honor what you have done up to this point. Uh, it's amazing. I, I love your unique story of how you got into coaching. You know, there, uh, I think if you were to ask, what is the typical way someone gets into coaching? It's, you know, they were a track athlete, they went to school to be a teacher and then became a GA and all this kind of stuff. So I love the different avenues. It shows that, you know, someone right now is listening. We have a pretty good contingent of uh, athlete listeners. Someone right now is listening as a decathlete at such and such university studying business and was like, and is like, oh my gosh, wait, I could still be a track coach. Like I thought that was over because I chose business. They're going to hear that story. So that's one goal is uplift and honor uh, your journey. And I'm so grateful for you sharing that with us here today as we continue. The second goal is you know, the amount of listeners, which always still boggles me, it's amazing that you pressed play today. I'm so grateful uh, to bring value to them. And we have this large gamut uh, of, like I said, we have athletes, we have coaches that have coached 40, 50 years that listen to the podcast and everything in between. I'm curious, and this may actually be more personal for me in my business world and managing teams. I love how you said, you know, I asked you, how do you meld director of track and field and director of pin relays and your, your gut answer, your quick answer was find good people. And knowing some of your people, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. You've nailed that. That's great. Uh, and so when you talk about giving people jobs and, uh, you know, let, letting them be who they are and, and be successful, that means you have to give up control. And that's hard for people. That's hard for, uh, because of bad ego, ego is not bad. Ego helps drive us to make us better. So ego is not necessarily bad. Bad ego is bad. Uh, bad ego wants to, uh, say, yeah, you're going to be in charge of X, Y, Z corporate sponsorships. We'll use as an example, but then when they don't do it the way you already had envisioned it, 
well, hey, you did it wrong. How do you, how do you let go? Does that make sense? How do you, you know, yeah, at this I'm team? Smiling. Okay, yeah, yeah, go, I'm go. I'm to reply, so go. I don't have it mastered. I mean, that's definitely a tug of war. <laughs> Dude, I you're supposed sometimes to teach us. I do it, sometimes I do it successfully, and oftentimes I do not. So mm -hmm. I'm sure the people who I work with will say, you know, some will say, hey, I feel very empowered. I'm doing great. And others will feel like, you know, you know, you know coach is concerned or wants a different, like, so it's, it's a tug of war. I, like I said, it's been an evolution for me. And, but I try to sit down, I realize that there's no way, like you said, there's no way I could personally uh, do all these things well. Mm -hmm. So I need to uh, figure out which things I can put my own time and energy in. Like for me, I'll just share this. I love coaching. I love coaching and teaching. So when you say, when I prioritize my day, my first goal is I'm going to see these athletes. We're going to have practice. I, I like to keep that on the top of my list, right? Mm -hmm. So now I have a lot of responsibilities with pen track and pen relays, but those for me are coming second because I still in my heart love the coaching piece, but I feel like those other things, A, I can do them because not all of them are that time sensitive, or B, I have great people helping me in all those different areas to make those happen. And I'm working with them and we're putting two heads are better than one, but I know I've got great people. So, but but to answer your question, I, I definitely don't have it mastered. I'm not like everybody else. Like in, you have that feeling at times, like boy, if that doesn't happen, in the end, it's my responsibility. Right. So you know, there, there is a part of me that's always sort of, you know, anxious and hoping that it all comes together. But again, I, it's it's something I'm working at, and hopefully, I'm getting better at it with time. That uh, that really, and then we we try to evolve every year and every season. I look at even at Penn Track. Like every summer, we sit down and we say, okay within our staff, what things went well, what things didn't, and who might be able to change their responsibility. Like, oh, this year, this person worked with compliance and that person worked with equipment You know, on our staff. Maybe we should try it different. Maybe that's not your skill set. So we're always trying to not only just add new people, but within our own staff, play to people's strengths or how does someone get a little bit better? You know, So that's a long answer, but I don't have it mastered, but I'm trying very hard to... Uh, to do that effectively. No, uh, first of all, I appreciate your openness and authenticity there uh, because you have to have some goodness to it or, you know, the pin relays and uh, pin track team would implode. I mean, it's just, it's just too big for you to try to micromanage it all. So I knew you had to have some skill set in there. So I really appreciate your authenticity, authenticity uh, and humbleness of there. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not great at it. Though. I'm not, I'm not perfected it. I'm still working on it. I, I think the real lesson there, what I like about that is that summer evaluation. So uh, what I heard you say is, okay, we try things. And then if it fails or it doesn't go as good as we want, will we sit down and say, well, what, what should change? Should, should you work with that person? Should you go do this type? Let's, let, let's not just get set in our stone and say, well, so-and-so has been doing this for five years, just keep going, even though it's not working. You're, you're, it sounds like you're constantly evaluating yourself and the team on how to continue to move forward in a positive manner. Yeah, I mean, I think in every aspect, we're trying to constantly improve, right? Whether you can or can't, we almost leave nothing the same, you know, like, whether it's, hey, here's how we recruited last year. Okay, we did well, mm. but like, what aspect of recruiting could we do different or try or what would be better? Or we're, we're, you know, and, and it's true of everything, whether it's, you know, how we coach, how we recruit, you know, how we run in the track meets, like, we're just gonna, we're gonna keep pushing ourselves for constant improvement. Uh, and I think that's, you have to, right? So like, once you get complacent and how can we make the pen relays better, you know, and we're just going to keep pushing to see, like, keep evaluating, how do we get better? Um, that's what we're trying to do. All right. I got, uh, I'm going to say I got three more topics, but you know, with tangents, man, me and you, we might kind of come up with 30 more. Uh, you brought up one of the topics, recruiting. How... <laughs> Uh, so a good friend of mine is Mark Davis, now head coach at Troy University. That's my alma mater. Um, yeah. And, you know, his uh, wife, Michelle Clayton, uh, you know, she came from Dartmouth and he came from Yale. And I remember him calling me up uh, when he was interviewing because uh, I'm a big Troy. My my son's name is Troy. That's how big that school is to me. OK. And so someone had given Mark uh, my number and he calls me and says, hey, I'm going for an interview, you know, next week. Um just wanted to pick your brain, blah, 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 blah. And I remember going, uh, so Mark, you're uh, you're at Yale University, right? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I go, well, I got good news and I got bad news. <laughs> you, know, he, you know, he's just like, what is this guy talking about? I said, well, Mark, 
I go, um, you know how I assume at Yale, you have to like go recruit nothing but 36 ACTs and whatnot. I was like, well, good news is you ain't got to worry about that. You can recruit 18s and stuff. And I said, bad news is I assume you probably don't have much of a, um, uh, a problem with academics at Yale. You will always have an ac uh, academic issue. Like you will always have study halls and, and what have you. How do you, you know, you've been at Princeton and, and not that, you know, TCNJ is, is a heck of an academic school, by the way. Uh, but Princeton and now Penn, you know, the top of the top, you, you're competing against not only every Ivy League school, but you're competing against Stanford and Northwesterns. I mean, just, you know, the top of the top academic institutions. There's only so many, and you do it with a really, like you get really good kids. <laughs> uh, there's only so many good kids that have those test scores and GPAs and aptitude to be successful at those institutions. How do you do it. I, I mean, your pool of recruits, I imagine, just have to be so small and everybody is a, is, a, is attacking those kids. How do you do this, Steve, at such a great level? Yeah. So should I not give out any recruiting secrets? Yeah, don't give out any secrets. I'm just, I'm, how do you, how do you keep your sanity saying, more than anything? <laughs> I'm just using, what I'm saying is I think the thing I would say is of all three schools I've personally coached at, and if I was coaching anywhere else, you know, the first thing is to figure out like what what does this place have to offer and who am I chasing right so like you know there's a lot of great schools in all different you know situations and what I always say in our coaching staff we try really hard to find pen people mm -hmm. what I mean by that is like who has what we have to offer here who, who wants what we have to offer what I mean by that is there's all the variables right yeah there's high level academic schools does the financial aid work do you want to be in the city or in the country do you want to what part of the country do you want to live in what team atmosphere do you want? Like, there's just all these variables. And, you know, I think I've been saying for years in my recruiting visits, like, hey, you know, you know, a student's like, oh, I don't know, there's all these schools. They said, well, start making a list of what you're looking for. Like, start checking boxes, how big of a school. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of variables. And I guess our hopes is that I think Penn's an amazing opportunity and, you know, an outstanding opportunity, but it's not for everybody. It, it's got to be a match. So I always tell students, look for a match. And I, I literally tell students, if another school checks more boxes than us for what you're looking for, you should go there. Mm. I'm not trying to trick you into coming to Penn. Like if Penn checks the boxes of what you're looking for, we want you at Penn because we want people excited and passionate about being at Penn. And the reality is there are a lot of good students out there in track and field across all event groups. So we can find qualified students. I mean, yes, it's not everybody's qualified academically, but there's mm. a lot of good students. Our sport, you know, I think the nature of our sport is people who do well in it, like they have a work ethic. They, you know, if you're going to be good at track and field and take your ability to the fullest, you're going to work for it. Those same skills go into the classroom, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of great students out there in track and field. And then for us, you know, Penn's an amazing place. I mean, it has to work financially, but we have great need-based financial aid for those that qualify. So, you know, we walk up to that one early to make sure it can work for a student. Uh, and then we're fortunate, right? I mean, we, we enjoy being in the city of Philadelphia. We've got great facilities. Um, yeah. You know, I think we have a ton to offer, but it's got to be a match. You're right. You know, and that's the same way I felt when I coached at TCNJ and the same way I felt at Princeton. Like, it's got to be a good match. But, you know, we do hustle. I mean, we do have to recruit uh, a lot more people for the people we end up getting just to find the, the right ones. You know, you, you know, we, we have a pretty diverse uh, class coming in every year. And, you know, our roster is usually between 50 and 60 for both genders. So, you know, we have to bring in, you know, give or take 15 people a year for both sides. And we want it to be a diverse group, but we don't recruit 15 to get 15. We we certainly right. have to start with a broader group. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think you brought up a great point there about the fit. You know, I think some people, uh, usually not very successful people long term in, in our profession, think that if they're successful recruiting at one school, that, well, they'll be successful anywhere. Cause, you know, it's my style or, or whatnot. Uh what you need at Penn is different than what Northwestern needs or Stanford or uh, University of Chicago. It, it is different by school. It's not just the person and your personality recruiting. Uh, it is that fit of that school. Someone, someone who wants to be in a more agricultural country type of school probably is not going to do very well in the middle of Philadelphia, but the reverse is true as well. Someone who wants, uh, you know, a, a city rural type at, or a, uh, yeah, rural type atmosphere is going to maybe thrive at Penn instead of a, a more agricultural type school. So I, I think that's a really great point about the fit. Uh, and I love how you, you know, we, we have to learn this in, in sales, Steve. Uh, and it's really hard for us. We, we tend to think in sales that everybody's our customer. And, and that's just simply not true. I love how you put there's like, not every kid's a, 
a pin kid, you know, and uh, if, if, if this other school checks more boxes, you know what, that's probably what's best for you. Uh, because if you did come here and we didn't check very many boxes, you're not going to be happy. I'm not going to be happy. We have a lot of other problems now uh, at that point. So I love that humility of like, hey, we're not, you know, we're great. We're not for everybody, but we're, we're great for the people who do uh, are looking for the the things that we do here at Penn. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's tough sometimes. <laughs> that's really Well, and I said here, like tough. we started this conversation, I competed at the University of St. Thomas, which is division one now, but was division three at the time I right. competed. And it was a great match for me. I had great yeah. opportunities, great great coaches. I got to compete at a national level, which I probably wasn't at that point ready to do in division one. Like it was great for me, you know? So, and I felt strongly when I recruited TCNJ that for a lot of people I was recruiting, that was the best option. That was a great option, like academically, financially, athletically. And uh, so, you know, I think you got to, you know, figure out what you've got to offer and, and go find people that that's a great match for. All right. Next topic. Uh, I feel like I have a pretty unique distance uh, coach here because of the background with the decathlon and stuff. And uh, even the background of not being an exercise phys type of major and, and learning that stuff. We talked earlier about the four minute mile. This just kind of came up as we were talking about that. It, it's still a special barrier, uh, just like 26.2 is a special barrier. You know, more people brag about running a marathon, whether you run it in six hours or two hours, uh, than they do of running a 50 miler. Like there's certainly longer races, uh, than the marathon, but the marathon running a 26.2 is special running four minutes for the mile is special, regardless of how many people do it every year now. But I am curious, you know, in, uh, behind the scenes here. So you're listening to this during pen relays week where the pen relays start this week, uh, and go through the weekend. It's going to be amazing, but we're actually recording this before even conference meets indoors. And I just saw a thing on Twitter uh, this weekend, 354 for the Division I men's mile, I believe is 16th. And we take 16 to the national meet. 354, uh, I think it was Connor Mance was the guy they listed for BYU, was what he ran in 2012 to set the collegiate record. <laughs> so not that long ago, that was the national record. And now it's not going to, it's 17th, by the way. I said 16th. It's also 17th. Someone's running 354 in the mile and not going to nationals. That's bonkers. What do you think? I'm not going to, I'm not going to pinpoint you and say, what is the one thing? Cause usually the one thing is not the one thing. What are the, give me your thoughts on, is it the shoes? I hear that a lot. And I understand, and I appreciate technology just as much as the next guy. Is it training? Was it COVID? You know, we had another year of training, you know, we got, uh, you know, deeper into our training where maybe some of us are a little bit older as well. So we had more training. Uh, is it just the natural evolution of the event? What is, what's going on? with uh, specifically the mile, but, you know, and not just distance, it's everything right now, by the way, but what's your thoughts on why in the world is 354, the college record one day, and now you don't even get to the national meet the next. Yeah. I definitely think it's funny because I think all of us as coach have been kind of readjust in all events, what's fast or what's competitive. As I said, back <laughs> at TCJ, I used to say, Hey, as we raise the bar, people jump higher. I think it's happened in mm. almost all event groups at this point. Like you can play that game with a lot of events saying what it took, X years ago to go to nationals, what it takes now, it's the levels are up, right? right. And the mile is an easy one to look at because you have the four minutes in your head. But I think there's a bunch of variables, honestly, Mike. Like, yes, technology matters in sport, right? So whether the track surfaces are faster mm -hmm. or the shoes are better designed, I definitely think there's a variable. But that's true in, you know, the pole vault too, right? We got yeah. the better pole vault poles, people for jump sure. higher. So yeah. I think that is, it's good. I mean, it's, it's better for people's health and performance, right? But then there's other variables too. We have evolved in training, right? Like people learn more about the body and what's working. And I think there's new training uh, methods and philosophies that are probably better than the ones that we did 15, 20 years ago, right? So a training has evolved. The other thing is I do think the internet has been helpful. Like we can all A, access the training or B, you know what everybody else is doing. Oh, wow, that person high jumped this high. I better make that next bar. Like knowing what's out there and what level you have to get to is motivational and educational. So we all have access to that information instantaneously, good or bad, <laughs> we have all <laughs> yeah. information instantaneously. And then the one thing I think that's specific to collegiate competition though is, um, you know, coming off of COVID and stuff, there is a lot of extra eligibility. So I think that a lot, I sort of joke that no one ever graduates, but there are a lot of people that have been able to their benefit, of course, and teams benefit to extend their college experience right. into graduate school or so forth. So we have a lot of people competing as fifth and even sixth year athletes. So I, I don't think that's something that I, we should take lightly. Right. We always had people extending, but not as many as now. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. we're in a cycle that's unique that people that would have graduated a year or two ago are still competing at the collegiate level. 
So the depth of high level talent and maybe the age of competitors is also noteworthy uh, relative to what it was five and 10 years ago. And I think that's noteworthy, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think technology training um, and, and then frankly, that there are a number of people that have been able to extend their college careers beyond what they would have five and 10 years ago really makes it a deep and talented field. And the other thing that is great about our sport is our sport is a worldwide sport, right? So, you know, if you look across the event groups, especially in division one athletics and in track and field, like it's very international. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the best of the United States that are competing at the colleges. It's the best in the world. Right. So boy, there's a lot of variables that have just pushed the level of performance up. Yeah. That's why I didn't want to say what's the one thing doing it because I, I don't, I don't believe that the one thing is the one thing. Um, there are multiple variables. Certainly the shoes technology is better. I, I think the coaching is better to your point as well. And I think you brought up a great point too. I remember when we moved to the regional system and so, you know, the 48th gets into, you know, the East or West region and it was like, Oh, that 48th is going to get a lot better because now you have a bar. So that bar, you know, again, to, to your point about kids raising the bar, coaches as well. It's like, oh, man, I used to be able to coach a six foot high jumper uh, on the women's side. And that was pretty good. Well, now that doesn't even make it to national. So I better figure out how to coach them to be a six foot one, six foot two, et cetera. So I think it, um, it again, talking about, you, you know, your life as a coach and person as an amalgamation, I think all of this flows into it um, uh, to, to, to make what we are now seeing, which is just bonkers, which means in 10 years, this is going to look you know, uh, slow. And so, oh, remember when 354 used to make it? Now you got to run 350 or what, you know, it's just, uh, the human I, body's amazing. It's not going to stop. <laughs> I tell them, I look, I look at it as an exciting time. I think some people who, you know, are, are have been coaching for a long time feel like, oh, you know, it's, you know, they, they almost feel like, oh, the shoes have changed it. It's like, I say, let's get used to people running faster. And also, you know, I welcome the competition. I think it's great that, you know, our sport, uh, you know, has allowed some people to get that extra eligibility and use that eligibility and so forth. And let, let's keep pushing the bar. And, you know, I see it within our own team and we have some stuff like we have multiple guys over 18 feet in the pole vault and, you know, our women's four by four, you know, uh, indoors ran, you know, 329. Like this is stuff that's unique for, for, for a place like Penn, but our athletes are, they're not putting limits on themselves. Right. Like if someone else can do it, maybe I can do it. So it's right. like, I feel like, you know, uh, the limits of, have gone away. People think they can can do more. It's yep. it's exciting. That goes all the way back to Bannister in the four minute mile. No one thought you could do it, and then when he did it, like a lot of people started doing it. <laughs> uh, and now right. everybody does it every year, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, Steve. Last question. I always like to end uh, most of our interviews by asking, "What's got you excited about the upcoming year with Penn?" And you know, whether it's this year, five years, you know, things like that. But you actually touched on something that is really exciting. Because even though we have a more of a, a density in the New England Northeast area of indoor tracks, we still have a very limited inventory of indoor tracks in this country. We really saw that during COVID when we had to limit the amount of people in, in facilities. And God bless out West, they have like three tracks, you know, now four of Spokane, but uh, very limited. But even in New England, Northeast area where we have a lot, we don't have a lot. And University of Pennsylvania stepped up and they're not just building an indoor facility here. Uh, the Ott Center is, uh, it's amazing. What, uh, so, so kind of explain, you, you gave us a quick overview. L let's talk about that a little bit more. Talk to us about this indoor facility. What's it going to do for your program and what's it going to do? Are we going to do an indoor pen relays? What, what are we going to do with this <laughs> facility as well? Yeah, it's incredibly exciting, Mike. So I, I smile because when I first came to Penn, there was talk of like, we'd like to do an indoor facility. Of course, that's 12 years ago. But as I got to know the alums, the alums from the 1970s and 80s kept saying, we were talking about indoor facility in the 1970s and 80s. So it has been quite a process and, and time to make this thing come to fruition. Sure. But it's incredible. Um, so first of all, our alumni community has stepped up huge. So to acknowledge that Dave and Jay Knott um, are, are the lead donors to, to make this happen. But we also have Adrian Brian Sheth, who were or, uh, Adrian ran in track and pen, and Jay Alex, and and so those are three kind of pen track alums that have sort of our lead uh, donors to make this happen, and many others who've joined them in the pursuit of of, of raising the funding to do something that's really going to change the landscape of not just pen track, but East Coast and track and field. Right. It's incredible, and of course the university's contribution and stepping up and supporting the project as well. But yeah, it's going to be amazing. So there isn't a 200 meter banked indoor track in the Philadelphia metropolitan area, and there never has been. So it's an exciting uh, time for the for our team, and it's an exciting time for this region of the country to have this facility going. And 
you know, they're really, uh, you know, doing it the best. It's, it's world-class. It's a, you know, 200 meter banked indoor track with a, a 12 degree bank and the widest radius. And then field events trying to make them world-class, like, you know, the high jump or the pole vault and the long jump, they've put in recessed runways and a dedicated throws cage. That's going to be fantastic. And, you know, we're really trying to make it a, a world-class competitive facility. Uh, honestly, it's tough in a city campus. It's uh, we don't have a lot of space, but it's really right. it's right outside of Franklin Field, right between Franklin Field and the river. So it's just a stone's throw from Franklin Field, maybe awesome. less than a quarter mile just out the back door. But we are limited in land space. So uh, we've used every inch of it that we could. And uh, the facility has some seating limitations. It's probably a little over a thousand uh, permanent seats that we have in the building. Right. But uh, we're excited about what it'll mean for our program, our athletes. Uh, collegiate meets. And we're also excited about what we can do for the track and field community. We're definitely going to be hosting high school meets and some open or uh, masters type competitions. And we want the facility to be good for the Philadelphia community and track and field at large. So yeah, quite an exciting time as you can imagine. Well, it's obviously you're not busy enough as the director of track and field, director of pin relay. So now you've got another facility, which you're going to host a lot of meets and uh, you know, it's coordinate your own practice times and things like that. So you just, you know, uh, you're just not busy enough, Steve. One of these days, you're going to have to stop getting bored and adding all these things and just continue moving forward with what you got, man. <laughs> you know, Mike, one of the things I said to you when you asked me about why my pen, and this is why. I mean, when I when I looked at pen, I said, you know, I love to coach the athletes and, and sort of continue with the track and field tradition. We've had some amazing, you know, recently we had Javelin National Champ, Mark Minicello, mm -hmm. Nia Akins, who won the USA Championships last year, was run, NCAA runner-up at Penn. You know, we've had some just incredible athletes and I want to continue that tradition. But I also was super excited about Penn for exactly what we're doing right now. You know, like I thought that this place could make a difference in the sport at large. You know, we already start with the footprint of Franklin Field, one of the most historic stadiums in the country and the Penn Relays. But in recent years, you know, we've hosted elite level high school national meet in the summer. We've had open meets in the summertime. Now we're adding indoor meets. Like I, I really think that we have a chance, you know, in the city of Philadelphia and at Penn, to do something really special on the bigger landscape of track and field. And truthfully, I know this sounds funny, but from the very beginning, that was one of the things that inspired me about coming here. So I'm really glad to be a part of that. Now, these indoor meets, I will not be running these indoor meets. Someone else will make that all happen. I'll just uh, stop by and check them out. But uh, it's exciting. Oh, man, it is exciting. You know, uh, we have a saying around here, healthy things grow. You know, if you think about gardens, people, businesses, they don't grow if they're not healthy. In fact, they, the opposite is. And so for our sport, for the school, the university of Pennsylvania, and for your program, anytime someone gets a new facility, that's exciting because it's growing. The sport is growing. Your program is growing this indoor facility, which is, you know, I, I don't know that I ever thought it would happen because of, simply because of the land, I, there is no land. I, you know, we've been there. There's no land. You know, there's nothing there uh, that hasn't already been taken uh, that's being used. So love that you found uh, the ability to to build this again, not a compromised indoor facility, which would have been amazing again because of land and you know things like that to build a, a first class facility. It's so awesome. It's exciting to see the success that you guys have had up to this point, and now you add this. You talk about a boost to recruiting, a boost to training, a boost to the overall performance, uh, happiness of your uh, coaching staff. Uh, this is a big, big part of continually moving forward and growing. So uh, we're just excited for you guys to be real honest with you, man. Healthy things grow, and we just love, love seeing that for for your program. Yeah, we're excited. We, I mentioned before that one of our themes is we try to say, you know, Penn Track and Field family. We like to see it as a family. And we have a couple pillars of Penn Track and Field, but the first one is kind of unity. We want our team to be unified. And we're kind of saying we now have a new indoor home, right? Like you mentioned how hard it is to get people together uh, in one space to train, but we have that home uh, coming in the fall for indoor track and field. So it's gonna be really cool uh, for our group to be able to gather there on a daily yeah. basis and see each other and train. So you know, as you can imagine, we're, we're more than excited about it, what it means for Penn and, and I think what it can mean for the track world. I love it. I love it. Well, it's pin relays week guys. So whether you're online and checking out results, whether you're there at the meet, I hope to see you there. I'm actually going to be there again this year. I, they couldn't keep me back. Even with the rain we had last year in the four by four. I, and I said, I was very dutifully. I sat there the whole time and got soaked, but I, I quite enjoyed it. We're going to be there again. And I think we're adding, correct me here, Steve. Uh, we're adding back a type of USA versus the world. We're going to be on TV for some relays with some uh, team USA and other countries. 
Yeah. So what, what's exciting is, yeah, the last few years, we definitely uh, will continue to have a prime block on Saturday mm -hmm. where we have professional events. So we will again have a number of individual professional events. But yeah, we we're excited. We actually were able to team up with World Athletics. Uh, World Athletics uh, this year uh, has encouraged us to help out in putting on some relays. We're calling them the global relays. And the reason for that is um, the following week, one week after Penn Relays is the World Relays. And that is the qualifying and stepping stone for countries to make the Olympics. So we're providing a unique opportunity and it's fun for us, but we've invited countries from around the world to come run the 4x100 and 4x400 at Franklin Field at the Penn Relays, more or less as a tune-up or preparation for the World Relays and then hopefully ultimately the Olympic Games. So we'll have a men's and women's 4x1 and 4x4 uh, as part of our Saturday afternoon program. Uh, again, calling it the Global Relays, uh, since we have countries from around the globe. It's yeah. it's going to be super exciting. That's cool. That's cool. Well, Steve, um, you know, even more so after hearing all the things that you have to do in your positions <laughs> there at University of Pennsylvania, uh, just so grateful for your time, man. I, you know, I, I always tell people when they talk about our podcast here, you know, it's not an easy podcast to listen to because it's so long. You know, we don't do the 20 minute, 30 minute. We, I, I really... Uh, we're very intentional on in getting deep into our guest and your career and uh, mentors along the way. So it, it takes time. Your your career, your what you've done in the sport deserves hour and a half, two hours uh, worth of uh, of investigating. So uh, it's not easy to listen to, but guess what? That means it's hard to be on the show. And so you know to ask two hours of your time, Steve, to sit down with us and uh, prepare for us and then go over some amazing memories and, uh, you know, talk about some exciting things that have happened and exciting things that are happening there in your program. We're just so grateful, man. I know you're busy. I know you probably have uh, 50 emails that packed up and phone calls and there's probably someone at your door and uh, there's just so much to do. So very, very thankful for your time. Very grateful uh, for you to sit down with us this week and talk about your really amazing career that is still going, my friend. That's the crazy, awesome part mm -hmm. is you've had an amazing 30 years. There's still so much more to go. And we're excited to watch from the sidelines and see what you and your program continue to do for our sport. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for the opportunity, Mike. Like I said, I'm humbled. I've, I know that you've had a lot of great uh, people join you on the show here. So I'm humbled to have been a part of it. And I hope uh, maybe there's a few snippets that will be helpful with someone else out there. But let me just close with you know, a thanks to all those that have made my career uh, uh, as much fun as it's been. And I am excited about the future, but for all the athletes I've had the honor to work with and the amazing coaches and administration and alumni. And, you know, I tell you what, it's, uh, it's humbling when you think about all the people that uh, have helped uh, me and the, and the teams that I've been a part of uh, to have this experience be successful. So, but yeah, the sport of track and field special. And, you know, I think we're all trying to do our part to make it grow. And, and uh, thanks for what you and, and, and Gil and your team is doing uh, in that regard. Absolutely. Well, it's uh, it's an honor to be involved in this sport. It's, it's this sport was long before all of us. Uh, this sport will continue long after all of us. So to you know have the responsibility during the time we're here, uh, it's an a, an amazing uh, responsibility that we don't take lightly in all the things that we do. So so thankful again for Steve being here this week. Thankful for you again. This podcast doesn't. It's great to have guests, but you know if no one listens, it's kind of like that tree falling. Does it really make a sound, right? Uh, but you're here again, once again, as we're in episode two. 256 that still boggles my mind fifth season we're gonna continue moving forward and bringing great people like steve dolan here uh to the podcast join us next week we'll do it all over again but make sure this weekend let's watch the pin relays maybe i'll do something i don't know do you have a no streaking policy i gotta figure out some way to get on tv but not get in jail there that's a delicate balance for me in those things but check us out this weekend on the television and then uh, next week on the podcast thanks everybody appreciate you